I would like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 55, a passage that means so much to me, I'm sure to many of you. Uh, we've lately looked in some Old Testament passages. Uh, I've just found some rich lessons and applications from them, and this, again, being one of those great passages I felt led to share with you this morning. Leading into this season of Thanksgiving, and we know this, this coming Thursday, most of us are probably going to sit down to a great feast. We're probably going to eat way more food than we ought to. After we do that, we'll probably get rather drowsy. We'll probably take a nap, maybe watch a little bit of football, or maybe watch a Christmas movie. We'll probably eat some leftovers, again, more than we probably should. So we'll be thinking about that great banquet that awaits us perhaps in a few days, but this is an opportunity to take a look at the greatest banquet of all. Verses 1 and 2. These are the words of God to the nation of Israel and to us. When he says, Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters, and you without money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. This is an urgent appeal from God our Father. When he says, listen up, he says, I'm making you a generous and a gracious offer. I make that offer to those that are thirsty, to those that are hungry, and to those that are penniless. As someone has said, God is inviting us to more than a soup line of basic sustenance. His invitation includes a banquet table spread with the richest of fare. Indeed, that's what God calls us to, a lavish banquet, the very, very best that God has to offer to us. And so come, everyone, listen, everyone, to what it is that I offer to you. It is interesting that Jesus echoed a very similar appeal in John 7, verse 37, when he says, on the last and most important day of the festival referring to the Feast of Tabernacles, it says that Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. Almost exact words that God offers that we read about here in Isaiah 55. Again, a great appeal, a great invitation that is based upon need. If you are thirsty, if you are hungry, if you are poor, so the idea is that if we don't have a spiritual thirst, a, a spiritual appetite, then obviously this offer isn't for us. So we begin by thinking about how desperately do I want what God offers? Do I really, really want what God offers to me? It has to begin there. I think about Jesus' Beatitudes. They're all based upon a need, and, and these things are all indeed Surround, or around, revolve around a need like being the poor in spirit and mourning and being meek and gentle and hungering and thirsting for righteousness, especially that, and being merciful and being pure in heart. So if I have this real appetite, if I have this real thirst, if I have this real sense of need, then God's offer very much appeals to me. So those that have a genuine and desperate thirst and need, God offers, as we just read, three things. He offers water. He offers milk. He offers wine, and they're very, very significant. We can go for quite a while without food. We can go for about 30 days, maybe 40 days without food. We know how it is with water. We can literally only go a few days without water. God offers in these verses water to us, spiritual water to refresh us if we are spiritually and desperately dry individuals. So he offers to us water, but he also offers to us milk. I think about a newborn baby 
needing milk to sustain its life. Y'all remember that commercial a few years ago? Milk, it does a body good. That's truth in advertising. Kind of rare. <laughs> but milk does a body good. We need milk for nourishment. We think about spiritual milk that God offers here for the spiritually weak individual. The Apostle Paul talks about milk and meat. And there were those who should have graduated to, to uh, meat, but they still needed the milk of the word. So God offers spiritual milk for those that are spiritually weak. Then he offers wine. Wine is associated with celebration. It's, it's associated with joy. And I think about Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine, a joyous occasion. And it was a picture of the joy of the coming age because wine represents that in the Bible. It represents the joy of the coming kingdom, a great celebration. Earlier in Isaiah, in chapter 25, verse 6, it says that the Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on this mountain, Mount Zion. A feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. Kind of interesting, God makes that point twice. We're going to have some really good meat, but we're going to have some aged wine, some finely aged wine, some of the best wine that's to be had anywhere. So we see what God is offering to us in these three things, these three drinks. He offers water to refresh our dry spiritual soul. He offers milk to nourish us, to, to build our bodies up, to build us up. He offers wine for joy and celebration. And so when you think about God's offer here in Isaiah 55, you'd have to ask, what more could you want? God offers to us the very, very best. But he asks us this question. Why do you spend money on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? So God just stated, come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. God offers the very best free of charge. But then why would we consider working and trying to buy that which does not provide any real satisfaction? Why try so hard to earn from God what God freely gives to us through his grace? So why do we spend money? Why do we work on that which does not really matter that much? I think about things in my life I've wasted time on that really didn't matter that much. And I'm thinking of one in particular, one whole summer that I pretty much wasted. I built a fence in the first house that we owned. And I had some leftover 4 by 4 wood. And I thought I'd like to turn some nice decorative tops to put on the fence posts. And so I remember my dad loaned me a lathe. And I took those pieces of wood. I spent hours to turn each one to put on top of the fence post. I got all done, and not a two of them looked alike. So that was not a good thing to start with. But I remember my neighbor came over after watching me put in all this effort all summer. And he said, how much could you have bought those for at the local hardware store? And he, we came up with the price. And he did a little bit of math for me. And he figured out that all of my effort was worth maybe about 15, 20 cents an hour. I had wasted pretty much a whole summer on a project like that. We can certainly waste our efforts spiritually as well. God's rich grace is free to us. But so often we try to wear ourselves out trying to earn that which God would freely give to us. So God says, listen carefully. Be diligent, not half-hearted, not casual, but listen carefully to this wonderful offer that I make to you. So in verses 3 to 5, he says, Incline your ear and come to me and listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation that you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. If we're willing, 
If we're hungry and we're thirsty, if we're willing to come to God and accept his generous offer, he says, I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. There was a time I would kind of glance over a phrase like everlasting covenant. But probably a couple of years ago, Joe, you taught a series of lessons that had a pretty profound impact on me that God has made some very specific covenants throughout the ages, one that hinges upon the other. They're all in place in a very real sense, and they extend to every one of us. God made a covenant to Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made one with Moses. He made one with David, which is in focus here. And because of that covenant, we have an everlasting covenant through Jesus, the descendant of David. Psalm 89 talks about this very covenant that we're looking at here. In Psalm 89, it says that the Lord said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build up your throne for all generations. I will also make him my firstborn, greatest of the kings of the earth. I will always preserve my faithful love for him and my covenant with him will endure. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as heaven lasts. It is a promise made to faithful David, but in particular it is a promise made to the descendant of David, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and our Lord. God wants to enter into a covenant with each one of us through that covenant that he made to David through Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. What a blessing that we can enjoy the new covenant. I'm reminded of the communion service. When we remember Jesus taking the cup says, This is the new covenant in my blood, the new arrangement. And so through God's gracious offer, we can have that hope. And verse 5 that we just read here talks about a nation which knows you not. That's us. God's original covenant was with the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. But a nation and a people that did not know him are brought in, and that is us. There is a place for us in the plan of God. God has graciously brought us in. So again, God extends a wonderful invitation to us, and it is an invitation that is urgent at this very moment because look at verses 6 and 7. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Right at this moment, we can have a new beginning. It does not matter about the past. It doesn't even matter about yesterday. What matters is right at this moment, you can seek the Lord and he will be found in this moment. You can call upon him right now because he is near. So you see, his gracious invitation has a note of urgency to it. We need to act upon it while we have the opportunity. At the end of this service today, we are going to give an invitation for you to respond, whether to begin afresh through prayer or to begin for the first time by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want you to think about that and think about what God is saying through his word concerning your part in that. But you can have a brand new beginning in this very moment. This moment's important because you have life and breath right now. This moment is important because uh, hopefully and prayerfully you have the desire to respond. In the next moment you may not have that desire. God may be placing the desire in your life right now. And so don't put it off because you may not care as much about it in the next moment. Sort of reminds me of the old song, Almost Persuaded But Lost. And what a tragic thing. It is needless because you can seek the Lord in this moment. Seeking the Lord, as it says here, requires forsaking your ways because we simply cannot have our way and have God's way at the same time. We've got to make a decision. Our ways are not his ways. It is a choice, a choice of the way we think and a choice of the way that we act because we're really not mentally wired to think as God would have us to think. Romans 12, 2 says that we should not be conformed to this age but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which sort of means we need a brain transplant spiritually. 
We don't have the right mindset, so we need to have a change in how we think and in how we act. Verses 8 and 9, God further says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. No wonder we need to forsake our ways. God's ways are so far elevated above our ways and above our thoughts. We're not on the same page by any stretch of the imagination. So if we want to seek the Lord while he may be found, we've got to get rid of the way we've been going, and we need to desire and hunger and thirst for his ways and his thoughts. God wants to bridge that gap concerning the difference because verses 10 and 11 tell us that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. That is always my confidence when I stand before you on a Sunday morning. If it's my word that I share with you, they're going to fall kind of right off the front of this podium. But if I share the word of God with you, as God has promised, just like rain goes into the world and accomplishes in nature what God desires, so is his word that goes forth. God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than ours, but God wants his word to bridge that gap. God's word goes out and appeals to us that we might respond, that it might bear fruit in our lives. That is the promise of those two verses. And finally, the last two verses of this great chapter. God says, then you will go out with joy and you'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. I think there's a song that kind of goes along these lines. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. What we just read, what God just described for us is the perfect picture of joy and peace and the blessings of a coming kingdom age. You know, you go back to the book of Genesis and man's fall and man's sin and the curse that came about. It says in Genesis 3, 17 and 18 that the ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. The legacy of Adam and Eve's sin are the weeds that grow in your garden, that grow in the fields. And so there's that curse upon nature, but what's described here is that curse is removed. No longer the weeds, no longer the thorns. Instead, there's, there is fruitful produce that comes up. It is a picture of the fulfillment of God's gracious offer to each one of us. That's what this whole chapter is about. It was written when the people of God were in captivity in Babylon. It was a dark time for them, but it was a gracious appeal to them. It is a gracious appeal to every one of us. It is the most generous offer that has ever been made. In fact, according to God's own words, you can leave your credit card behind, your wallet, and your purse. Because you don't need those things to buy what God offers. The thing that God wants from us is not our money. God wants us to be very, very serious in accepting what it is that he offers because he says, listen carefully, incline your ear, diligently seek, forsake your thoughts and your ways. It is a limited time offer as we've just read. Seek him right now while he is near. Seek him right in this moment when he can be found while you have a desire to act and you have the life to be able to do so. God's invitation is extended to you today. And I'm very serious about extending that to you today. And I want to extend a twofold invitation as we prepare to sing our closing song this morning. I want you to think about coming forward for prayer if you'd like a new beginning. Maybe you accepted Christ at some time in the past, but maybe things haven't gone the way that they should go, and it's time to begin again. 
we extend an, op- an invitation this morning for you to begin afresh. Perhaps more urgently, if you have never invited Christ into your life, this is the moment while you have a desire and you have life and breath because you don't know that you have another opportunity in the future to do it. It is urgent that you accept his invitation today in this moment. And so I especially appeal to those who are here who have not made that decision. That decision involves repentance. I regret the way I've gone. It involves faith. I believe that if I simply accept Jesus into my life, all can be forgiven. I can start afresh. I can have the hope of immortality in the kingdom of God if I act upon it today. And then you seal that with water baptism. And you know whether you've made that decision or not. Do not put it off another day. An invitation really means very little if you don't act upon the invitation. I'm thinking about, say, a a wealthy individual that writes up a generous contract. They're going to give you millions of dollars. This would be a great thing. The only thing that's required is your signature on the bottom to put the contract in force. What a shame to have a generous offer and never sign on the line, and that's the way it is with God's offer. All of this sounds well and good. In fact, you can sit in church week after week, and you can hear about the gospel, and one day stand before God and say, I heard that in church every week. But God knows whether or not you signed on the line because your name is either in the book of life or it is not, and that is based upon the deliberate decision that you made in response to his invitation. 